بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وخاتم النبيين محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلم تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد Respected listeners The title of today's talk is The Purpose of Life Now I'm sure we all know what the purpose of our life is and should be. And the purpose of today's discussion is not to be condescending and educate people on what the purpose of life is. Rather, it's more a reminder. lest we don't forget. And sometimes we may not forget in mind, but we do forget in practice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in a verse of the Qur'an, الَّذِينَ اتَّخَذُوا دِينَهُمْ لَهْوًا وَلَعِبًا وَغَرَّتْهُمُ الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا فَالْيَوْمَ نَنْسَاهُمْ كَمَا نَسُوا لِقَاءَ يَوْمِهِمْ هَذَا وَمَا كَانُوا بِآيَاتِنَا يَجْحَدُونَ Allah says, those who took their religion as a thing of jest and play, and the worldly life deceive, deceived them. So this day, Allah will say this on the day of reckoning. So this day we shall forget them just as they forgot the meeting of this day. So we may not forget in mind what the purpose of our life is, but in practice it's very easy to become forgetful and neglectful of our very purpose of existence, our reason for existing, the very objective of our creation. So what is it? The question is, why are we here? Why do we exist rather than not existing? Why is there something rather than nothing? Why isn't there emptiness? And why is there a universe and why is the universe filled with so many different things? And in the midst of all of this, here we are. We find ourselves as intelligent beings. Asking ourselves the question, why are we here? Why do we exist? What brought us here? And it's a fascinating question. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a reply. And in many different verses of the Qur'an, this has been answered in different ways. In one verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَفَحَسِبْتُمْ أَنَّمَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ عَبَثًا وَأَنَّكُمْ إِلَيْنَا لَا تُرْجَعِينَ in fact, just as we ask the question, who are we? Where did we come from? 
Why are we here? Why do we actually exist? What is our future? Where are we heading? What's our destiny? Where to where is our journey? Just as we ask this question, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us a question. And that question is, In fact, rather than, although the question is valid for the world, this verse is actually part of an exchange that will take place on the Day of Judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask his servants, كَمْ لَبِثْتُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ دِعَدَدَ السِّنِينَ كَمْ لَبِثْتُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ عَدَدَ السِّنِينَ قَالُوا لَبِثْنَا يَوْمًا أَوْ بَعْضَ يَوْمٍ فَاسْأَلِ الْعَادِّينَ قال إن لبثتم إلا قليلا لو أنكم كنتم تعلمون أفحسبتم أنما خلقناكم عبثا وأنكم إلينا لا ترجعون Allah says as part of this conversation on the day, on the day of judgment Allah will say How long did you stay? How long did you reside on earth? How many years? So people will say in reply we actually only stayed on earth for one day or part of a day. That's how, that's how long life will seem then. We stayed on earth for one day or part of a day. But we don't know. So Allah ask those who were counting, who were recording, i.e. the angels. So Allah will say in reply, in fact, you did not stay on earth except very little. If only but you knew. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, أَفَحَسِبْتُمْ أَنَّمَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ عَبَثًا وَأَنَّكُمْ إِلَيْنَا لَا تُرْجَعُونَ That what did you think? That we created you in vain. And that you would not be returned to us. فَتَعَالَ اللَّهُ مَلِكُ الْحَقِّ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ رَبُّ الْعَرْشِ الْكَرِيمِ So exalted be Allah, the just King. There is no God but He, the Lord of the noble throne. So Allah will say this, that exalted is Allah in answer to this presumption that Allah has created us in jest, in play, in vain, without purpose, without destiny, without wisdom, and that we won't be returned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No, of course we will. That is the very purpose of our creation. So what is the purpose of our creation? Allah says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created man and jinn except that they serve me. Not just worship me, but serve me. In another verse, O mankind, O people, be wary of that Lord of yours who has created you and those who came before you. Why? لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ In the hope that you may adopt taqwa. And what's taqwa? Taqwa is not just the fear of Allah. Just as ibadah is not only the worship of Allah. These are restricted meanings that we have given to these words. We often translate taqwa as a fear of Allah, which is correct, but it's only a partial translation. Taqwa, the fear of Allah, is only part of taqwa. We translate ibadah as worship, but worship is only a part of ibadah. So Allah Azza wa Jal says, I have not created man and jinn except that they illa li'abudun, that they serve me, not just worship me, that they do my ibadah. So what exactly is ibadah? And Allah also says that Lord, be wary of that Lord who has created you and those who came before you, la'allakum tattaqoon, in the hope that you may adopt taqwa. So what's taqwa? Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu anhu, the famous companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
he gave a very beautiful explanation of the word taqwa. And this was in the commentary of the, of the verse of the Qur'an, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu attaqullaha haqqa tuqatih, wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimoon, that, O oh believers, be wary of Allah, adopt taqwa in respect of Allah, haqqa tuqatih, as the taqwa of Allah should be rightfully observed. So, O oh believers, be wary of Allah as He should be as people should be wary of Him and do not die except as Muslims. So, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, the scholar of the Qur'an, the companion of Rasulullah he said in commentary of this verse that what exactly is the taqwa of Allah? He said the taqwa of Allah is well, he, he simply said in commentary of this verse that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be obeyed and not disobeyed. Allah should, people should pay gratitude to Allah and not be ungrateful of him. And then, وَيُذْكَرُ فَلَا يُنْسَى Part of taqwa is that Allah should be remembered and never forgotten. So taqwa is the constant awareness of Allah Azza wa The constant remembrance of Allah. And never for a moment forgetting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's actually very similar to ibadah. When Allah says, I have not created man and jinn except that they worship me. Sorry, except that they serve me. Ibadah isn't just the ritual prayer five times a day. Or hajj and zakah and siyam and fasting and charity on different occasions, whereby we separate our dunya and our deen. So it's almost like we live a normal life during the day. And then every now and then, that normal, dreary, daily life is punctuated by moments of connection with Allah. A salah, an act of charity, a good deed. But that's not the way it's supposed to be. As a Muslim, as a believer, we shouldn't draw this distinction between deen and dunya in the sense that we live a normal life of the dunya and that normal life of the dunya is only occasionally punctured and punctuated by the remembrance of Allah Azza wa Jal. That's not ibadah. Rather, ibadah is that a person, a person serves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A person becomes an abd of Allah, a slave of Allah, a servant of Allah. In fact, when we hear the word slave, it causes us to shrink slightly in distaste. That does ibadah mean that we become a slave to Allah? It does. But should we... Flee from the word slave of Allah. Should we fear the word slave of Allah? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the word and the title abd. He does. For his chosen servants, he describes them with the words abd and ibad. وَعِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانِ الَّذِينِ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنَا وَإِذَا خَاطَبُهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا Allah mentions a number of verses in which he describes the qualities and the characteristics of his chosen servants. And how does he describe them? وَعِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانِ And the slaves of Rahman, the slaves of the gracious one. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he gave him so much. He bestowed so much upon him. He gave him such a lofty rank. But in some of the key moments of describing him in the Qur'an, Allah uses no other title. Allah confers upon him the title Abd. <coughs> Even when he called him on that miraculous journey of Isra and Mi'raj, 
from Mecca to Al Masjid Al Aqsa, from Al Masjid Al Aqsa to the heavens and back on that amazing and miraculous journey. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes him. It was, a, it was a unique occasion, a very unique occasion. And even on that great, on that moment of glory, when he traveled from Mecca to Al Masjid Al Aqsa and there he led all of the Anbiya and Rusul, all of the messengers and prophets of Allah alayhim wa salatu wa salamu ajma'een. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam led all of them in salah. And he was given such honors, such accolades, such titles, and such a position on that one occasion that no prophets of Allah, no one in the rest of creation has ever been given. And on that occasion, how does Allah describe him? Allah doesn't give him any other title. Allah simply describes him with the words, Subhanalladhi asra bi abdih. Laylan min al masjid al haram ila al masjid al aqsa. Glorified be that Allah. Or hallowed be the name of that Allah who carried his servant by night, his slave by night. So, Abd, slave. That was the chosen title that Allah gave him on the occasion of Isra and Mi'raj. That hallowed be the name of Allah who carried his slave, his Abd, by night from Al Masjid al Haram to Al Masjid al Aqsa. And that was a noble messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In fact, even the Prophet Isa ibn Maryam alayhi wa sallam. Of all of the Prophets of Allah, Isa ibn Maryam is viewed in a manner in which even the Prophet is not viewed. Which is that Isa ibn Maryam is hailed as a god. Not just as a savior, but as a god. As a son of God and as God himself. And he is worshipped. He is supplicated to and prayed to and besieged. People besiege him. People implore him directly with their prayers. He is regarded not just as a messenger or a prophet or a savior or a messiah. He is viewed as a God, as the God, as God himself. Not just the son of God, but God himself. And even that Isa alayhi salatu was salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says of him, لَنْ يَسْتَنْكِفَ الْمَسِيحُ إِنْ يَكُونَ عَبْدًا لِلَّهِ وَلَا الْمَلَائِكَةُ الْمُقَرَّبُونَ That not even the Messiah will disdain, will frown upon, will look down upon, will turn up his nose. Not even the Messiah will disdain being a slave of Allah, and neither the closest angels. So the message here is, if not even the Prophet ﷺ, or any other messenger, or any of the angels, the closest angels, in fact, if not even that person who is hailed as a God himself, as the God, Isa, the son of Maryam alayhim salam, if not even he will disdain from being an abd, a slave of Allah, who is anyone else in the rest of creation? Why should we flee or fear, flee from or fear the term abd, slave? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes us to be his ibad. He wishes every one of us to be his abd, i.e. to be his slave. And the reason I say, why should we fear being a slave of Allah? Because the reality is, we are all slaves. For every moment of our existence, we are reliant on, dependent on, enslaved to something or someone. And at any given moment of our existence, we are a slave. We are an abd. We're either slaves to a system. We're either slaves to an idea. We're either slaves to someone else. Or even if we are so independent and so self-sufficient that we are free from being a slave to anyone or anything else 
ultimately we are enslaved to our lower self and our nafs and our desires. So we will be a slave. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Have you seen one who has taken his hawa, his passion, his desire, his nafs as his lord? So we will always be slaves. And that's why Imam al-Hakim al-Tirmidhi, rahimahullah, a famous scholar, not the Imam Tirmidhi of the Sunan of the Book of Hadith, but another one, Imam al-Hakim al-Tirmidhi, rahimahullah, he said something very beautiful. He said, those who are the slaves of Allah, they are the truly free ones. Only they are free. Those who are slaves to Allah, they are the ones who are free selves. Everyone else, they are slaves, but they are slaves to someone else or something else, not the slaves of Allah. So the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that we become his ibad, we become his slaves. And that is the meaning of ibadah, not just the occasional prayer, salah, act of charity, but rather ibadah. And what's the meaning of ibadah in that famous hadith later by Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim, from Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiyallahu anna, and other sahaba, radiyallahu anhum, when a man came who was unrecognized by the companions, and eventually they learned that that was Jibreel, alayhi salam, and he asked the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a number of questions. The hadith is famously known as the hadith of Jibreel. One of the three questions after Islam, well, the third question after Islam and after Iman was Ihsan. So Jibreel alayhi salam asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Mal Ihsan, what's Ihsan? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, An ta'bud Allah ka anna ka tarah, fa illam tukun tarah, fa innahu yarak. That Ihsan is that you worship Allah as though you see him. And if not, then that he sees you. If you do not see him, then know that he sees you. That is ibadah. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us. That we reach that rank whereby we become so connected with Allah and we observe such ibadah of Allah and we serve Allah in such a way as though not only are we constantly in connection with him, but that we are mindful of him. And that we see Allah, not physically, but with every being of our existence, with every fiber of our existence, every fiber of our being. We see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the purpose of our creation. And the dunya is only a conduit, it's a corridor, it's a passage. The dunya exists to carry us ultimately to our goal and destination, which is the akhirah which is the hereafter. And that's why we should see this as a carriage. Imam Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was once seated, was once with the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum. And the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum began a discussion about the dunya and the akhirah. What is the dunya? What is the akhirah? So some of the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum said that the dunya is a balagh, it's a conduit, it's a carriage to the akhirah. So it gives us an opportunity in the world to pray, to do good, whereby we can reach the akhirah and jannah. So the other sahaba, radiyallahu anhum, they said no. They spoke only of the akhirah. The discussion was about the good of the dunya about the good of the world. So some of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu said, the dunya is a balag, it's a conduit, it's a passage. It's a means of reaching Jannah and Allah in the, and, and the Akhirah. So in a way they were praising the dunya, but only in religious terms. And the other Sahaba radiallahu anhu spoke only of the Akhirah, not of the dunya. So when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam heard them, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Shall I tell you 
the position of the dunya in relation to the akhirah. The position of the dunya, of the world, in relation to the life thereafter, in relation to the second life, is as if, if one of you, the Prophet ﷺ said, if one of you was to walk to the, was to go to the ocean and dip in his finger and remove it, the amount of water that is reduced from the ocean, that is the relevance of the dunya in comparison to the ocean of the akhirah. And that was in the context of good, not in the context of the world and the love of the world, but it, in the context of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum discussing the world being a good opportunity and a conduit and a carriage to reach in Jannah and granting us an opportunity to do good in the world. Even about that, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the world is equivalent to the amount of water that is reduced when one extracts one's dipped finger from the ocean in contrast to the ocean itself. So our purpose is not the world, it is the Akhirah. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in that question, which ultimately is for the hereafter, it will be a question raised in the Akhirah, but it's relevant for us here now. What do you think that you have been created in vain? And that you will not be returned to us? Everything is about us returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We may not understand everything. We have limited intelligence. We are unable to grasp many things. And we will never know the truth of many things. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in clear, categorical, unambiguous terms that you have not been created in play in jest, in vain, aimlessly, purposeless, without purpose, without direction, without wisdom, you have been created for a certain reason. And that reason is taqwa, ibadah, and ibtila. The third one, which I haven't mentioned yet, is ibtila. تبارك الذي بيده الملك وهو على كل شيء قدير الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا وهو العزيز الغفور In a surah which we are encouraged to recite on a daily basis at night Surah Al-Mulk the, word, the, the surah begins with the words with a daily nightly reminder تبارك الذي بيده الملك وهو على كل شيء قدير Blessed is he in whose hand is the dominion, is the kingdom. And he is all powerful over all things. Alladhi, he, who created khalaq al mawta wal haya, he created death and life. One thing of note Allah doesn't say, خلق الحياة والموت Who created life and death He says الذي خلق الموت والحياة Who created death and life Why? ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عمدا So that he may test you to see who of you is the best in deeds So the third purpose of our creation is بلاء In fact, it's all one Whether it's taqwa, whether it's عبادة, whether it's بلاء ابتلاء it's all the same. Allah tests us to see who is the best indeed. And it is He, Allah, who made you deputies on earth. And He elevated and raised some of you over others in ranks. We aren't equal. We're very different. We have different potential. We have different abilities. We have different gifts, different talents. Of course we are apparently unequal. Some are apparently more intelligent than others, some are more appealing in appearance than others, some are more prepossessing than others, more handsome, more beautiful, more attractive than others, some are wealthier than others. Allah has given us different things in different ways. And often one 
a lack in something is compensated for by a gift in something else. Why all these differences? Why this apparent discrepancy? Why these differences in ranks and abilities? It's simply because لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ فيما آتاكم, So that Allah may test you in what he has given you. So the world is a place of test. We are being tested. And we will always be tested. Allah says, and we will most assuredly test you. The same bala. We will most assuredly test you. With some with a little bit of fear and hunger and loss of life and wealth and of produce and fruits. So in all of these tests and moments of loss, وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ Give glad tidings to those who are patient and perseverant. Those الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتُمْ مُصِيبَةً those who when an affliction strikes them, when a misfortune befalls them, what do they say? Indeed, we belong to Allah and to whom we shall return. Upon these people, there are salutations and prayers from their Lord and mercy. And these are the ones who are guided. Interesting thing here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Who are the patient and perseverant ones, the sabirin, who deserve glad tidings, even in their misfortunes and calamities? They are the ones who say, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. So why is it that just by saying, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un, Allah says, they should be given glad tidings? Allah praises them for being patient and perseverant. Allah says of them that upon them descend mercy from their Lord and prayers and that these are the ones who are rightly guided. How can a person achieve so much just by saying inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un? Someone suffers a great misfortune or even a small calamity. And they say, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. And just for saying, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un, Allah says, Give them glad tidings. They are the sabirin. Upon them are salawat, prayers from their Lord. Upon them is rahmah, mercy from their Lord. And they are the ones who are truly guided. How can all of this just for saying, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un? Well, the truth is, it's not just for saying inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. It's for saying inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un, believing in inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un, and living by inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. And so what is believing in and living by inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un? It's, but it's, why is that so rewarding? It's because it puts everything into perspective. No matter what calamity a person suffers, when a person says, indeed we belong to Allah and to Him we shall return. The same two things. That we are the slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We belong to Allah. One. And two, the world is not our abode. Our abode is the akhirah in which we shall return to Allah. So by saying inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un, by believing it and by living by it, a person gains all of these rewards because that is the purpose and destiny of our life. لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ So that Allah may test you. In fact, uh, today was Jumu'ah. And again, just like nightly, we are requested to, well, we are encouraged to 
pray Surah Al-Mulk, which begins with the words, Al-Mulk, which I just commented on. Who created death and life so that he may test you. Who of you is the best in deeds? Today was Jumu'ah. On a weekly basis, we have been encouraged to recite Surah Al-Kahf. And part of Surah Al-Kahf is, إِنَّا جَعَلْنَا مَا عَلَى الْأَرْضِ زِينَةً لَهَا لِنَبْلُوَهُمْ أَيُّهُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا and indeed, we have made all that is upon the earth a beauty for it, an ornamentation for it, an ornament. The world and all that it contains, Allah says we have made all that is on earth an ornament for the world. Why? So that we may test them. Ayyuhum ahsanu amala. Who of them is the best in deeds? Time and time again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in different verses of the Qur'an, sometimes as Surah Al-Kahf as a weekly reminder, as part of Surah Al-Mulk as a daily reminder, that Allah has created the world and its beauty so that he may test you. Allah has created death and life so that he may test you. The world is a test. We have come here, we've been brought here, we've been created for a higher purpose. And that higher purpose is the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, taqwa. Allah has not made the world in jest, in vain. In one verse, وَمَا خَلَقْنَا السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا لَاعِبِينَ مَا خَلَقْنَاهُمَا إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَهُمْ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Allah says, we have not created the heavens and the earth. لَاعِبِينَ Playfully. Allah uses that word, playfully. We have not created the heavens and the earth playfully. مَا خَلَقْنَاهُمَا إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ We have only created both of them for nothing but the truth. We have not created them except with the haqq. وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَهُمْ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ But most of them do not know. If we think that the universe has been created, the world has been created, without purpose, without direction, without motive, without wisdom. It's all one big accident. And life is a series of accidents. It's all chance. There's no origin, there's no destiny, there's no purpose then we will treat life as a game too. We will treat life as lahu, la'ib and abath. We will see life as futility, as vanity, as something which lacks meaning, which lacks purpose. And we will live our lives accordingly. And when we ask ourselves a question, why are we here? How did we get here? Where are we going? What's our purpose? Why do we exist? Well, one response is that sheer luck, pure accident, purely by chance. If we think along those lines, then what's stopping us? If we think we are just animals, like the rest of the millions of species on Earth, what do they do? They live a bestial life. And all these animals do, all these organisms and species do, is survive. Survive by any means possible. by murder, by deceit, by bloodlust. There's no compassion, there's no regret, there's no conscience. It's merely a game of survival. So if we are then just like all the other species and organisms in this world, that we simply exist and continue to exist, we simply survive and we should continue to survive, act by any means possible, then we are only advanced animals. 
If that's our philosophy, if that's our concept of life, that we are only advanced animals, then what prevents us from living like and behaving like animals? No scruples, no control, no conscience, no regulation, no control. In fact, that's what one of the verses of the, verse of the Qur'an says. Allah says, أَيَحْسَبُ الْإِنسَانُ أَنْ يُتْرَكَ سُدَى Does man think that he will be left without control? Suda means aimless, random. Does man think, does insan think that he will be left without control? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not created us randomly. And we will not be left randomly. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a path, a guide. And we have guided man to both paths. Speaking about the nafs and life and the soul, Allah says, having created it, Allah inspired the soul to both its good and its evil. Meaning, it recognizes both. Now it's up to the soul, the individual, to choose one of these two options, one of these two paths. So if we think that we are just advanced, highly evolved animals, yes, a bit different to all the other animals, then what prevents us from living and behaving and thinking just like the animals? No conscience, no scruples, no laws. No control whatsoever. Suda, as Allah says in the Quran. That does insan think, does man think, that he will be left suda, without control, without laws? So what is there preventing us? And we can, we can sink to that level. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ بِهَا of some people, لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ بِهَا وَلَهُمْ أَعْيُنٌ لَا يُبْسِرُونَ بِهَا وَلَهُمْ آذَانٌ لَا يَسْمَعُونَ بِهَا أُولَٰئِكَ كَلَنْعَامِ بَلْ هُمْ أَضَلْهِ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمْ الْغَافِلُونَ They have hearts with which they do not perceive or understand. They have eyes with which they do not see. They have ears with which they do not hear. These people are like the cattle. They are like animals. Nay, balhum adal. Rather, they are even more misguided. They are even more lost. Ulaikahum al ghafilun. These are the heedless ones. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that if we are neglectful and heedless of our purpose, of our destiny, then we can, through our misdeeds and our sins, we can actually sink to such a low level that Allah describes us as being even more lost than the animals. We can rise or we can sink. And when we sink, Allah, our Creator, tells us we can actually be worse than the animals. So if we think we're just highly evolved, intelligent animals, then what is there preventing us from behaving like animals? This is why Allah has given us guidelines, Allah has given us laws, Allah has given us a path. The Prophet وسلم, and the Anbiya والسلام, before him came to guide the people, to remind us of our purpose. And I keep on saying that our purpose is the Akhirah. The whole Qur'an points to that. Do you know what was the last verse of the Qur'an to be revealed? The last verse. According to some narrations, this was just a few days before the Prophet ﷺ left the world. The last verse to be revealed of the entire Qur'an. It wasn't at this day I have completed my blessing and favour to you. And I'm content with Islam as a deen and a religion for you. It wasn't that. 
The last verse of the Quran to be revealed was وَاتَّقُوا يَوْمًا تُرْجَعُونَ فِيهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ ثُمَّ تُوَفَّى كُلُّ نَفْسٍ مَا كَسَبَتْ وَهُمْ لَا يُظْلَمُونَ And be wary of a day in which you shall all be returned to Allah. Then each soul shall be repaid in full, whatever it has earned. وَهُمْ لَا يُظْلَمُونَ And they will not suffer any injustice. So think, the entire Qur'an, with its stories of the prophets of the past, with its stories of the pious, the entire Qur'an, with all its laws about marriage, about divorce, about trading, about transactions, about children, about living, with all its teachings about worship, about life, at the end of it all, the final verse of the Qur'an to be revealed was that after all of this, after everything in the Qur'an, your final message is, وَاتَّقُوا يَوْمًا تُرْجَعُونَ فِيهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ Be wary of a day in which you shall all be returned to Allah. That is, that is the final verse of the Qur'an. That is the final message of the Qur'an. This is what all of these verses point that your purpose and your destiny is the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one. Now whilst you are in the world, the taqwa of Allah and the ibadah of Allah, and whilst you are in the world, remember that the world is not your paradise. And you can't make it hell or paradise. But it's a world, it's an abode of ibtila, of being tested. That's the reality of the world. We will be living in a fool's paradise if we think we can make the world a paradise. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to make the world a jannah for anyone, he would have made it for his most beloved Nabi, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahmatullahi alayhi wa lays hadith in his Muslim. That Jibreel alayhi salam came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said to him, O Messenger of Allah, here is an angel. There was another angel. Here is an angel. He has descended from the heavens today and he is an angel who has never come down before and after meeting you he will never come again. And he has come with a message from your Lord. It's a hadith of the Muslims of Ahmed ibn Hanbal. So the angel, the second angel came to the Prophet sallallahu and said to him, O Messenger of Allah, I come with a message from your Lord. Do you wish to be a malakan nabiya o abdan rasoolah? Do you wish to be a prophet and a king? Just like Dawood, and, although the names Dawood and Sulaiman aren't mentioned, uh, that's my explanation, that just like the Prophet Dawood and Sulaiman and Yusuf alayhi salam, that do you wish to be a king and a prophet, or a abd and rasul, or a slave of Allah and a messenger? So Jibreel alayhi salam looked at the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and actually said to him, Tawada' li rabbik, that O Prophet of Allah, be humble before your Lord. Be humble before your Lord. So the Prophet said, Nay, I prefer to be a slave and a messenger, not a king and a prophet. And that's exactly the life he led. He suffered pangs of hunger, he suffered thirst, he suffered illness, he suffered bereavement. If Allah would have made the dunya a jannah for anyone, he would have made it for the Prophet Muhammad Yet he never. So if it wasn't paradise for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how can it be paradise for anyone else? And if someone says, well, what about all these other people? They enjoy everything. Surely it's paradise for them. 
the world of the pious is completely different. Ibrahim ibn Adham rahmatullahi alayhi was a famous saint. And he used to sit alone, meditating in retreat. And people would say, would say to him that, don't you feel lonely when you are alone in the wilderness? Because he used to sometimes retreat in the wilderness. Don't you feel alone? And don't you feel that you are lonely in the wilderness? And his reply used to, he used to reply to them with the words, how can I be lonely when I have Allah with me? And he used to say to them, I am not in the wilderness, you are in the wilderness. The world of the pious is completely different. For them, their joy, their happiness is in their hearts. And it's not even happiness. It's their contentment. There's a difference. It's their contentment. That's what Tumanina means. When people say, Allah says in the Quran, Ala bidikrillahi tutma innul kulub, know that in the remembrance of Allah, hearts do find. I'm not going to use the word peace. Because by doing so, we actually misunderstand the verse. Allah bi dhikrillahi tatma innul quloob. Lo and behold, in the remembrance of Allah, do hearts find tumaneena. Itma'inan. Tatma'in comes from the word itma'inan. Which means, what does itma'inan? And then the synonym of itmi'nan is tumanina. What do itmi'nan and tumanina mean in Arabic? Know that in the remembrance of Allah do hearts find itmi'nan. It's a word used in other languages as well, Asian languages, which simply say itmi'nan. It's itmi'nan. What does itmi'nan, itmi'nan mean or tumanina? Tumanina or itmi'nan means to be settled. Not to be turbulent, not to be disturbed, to be tranquil. It doesn't necessarily mean peace as we think it does. It means to be settled. So that means that even, this is why people say, I do dhikr all the time, but my heart doesn't find peace. Allah has promised that in the remembrance of Allah, hearts find itmi'nam. And yet we sometimes say, well, I do the dhikr of Allah, I worship Allah, I pray, and yet I don't find peace. So what, what is Allah's promise in this verse? And what exactly are we looking for? The meaning of hearts finding itmi'nan, or peace, if we were to say, is not that we find joy and happiness. How can a person find joy and happiness? In a life which is full of ibtila, as Allah Himself has said. Our parents are older than us, sometimes double our age. As we age and grow older, it's only to be expected that we will lose our parents. So some of us may have experienced bereavement as far as. Our parents are concerned, one or both. But how many of us have suffered bereavement of siblings? Bereavement because of siblings. Or even more testing, how many of us have suffered bereavement because of our children? And look at the Prophet. <coughs> Even before he came into this world, his father had passed away. At the age of six, his mother passed away. He went into the care of his grandfather. He only stayed with him for two more years. At the age of eight, his grandfather passed away. And in all of these years, he had no brother or sister. No sibling. 
When he grew older and he married, he had children. Sons and daughters. Qasim, his first son, died in infancy. A second son, Abdullah, died in infancy. His daughters lived to grow old. Zainab, Ruqayyah, Umm Kulthum, and Fatima radiallahu anhum. And of all of these, in his own lifetime, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw and witnessed the death and burial of his daughter Zainab and his daughter Ruqayya and his daughter Umm Kulthum. No parents, no siblings, no brothers, no sisters, no surviving children, except one son finally born from Maria Qibtiya radiyallahu anha, Ibrahim radiyallahu an, whom he dearly loved. And yet, barely two years later after his birth in the final year of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's life, he held Ibrahim radiyallahu an, his son, whilst he was dying in his arms. And he witnessed his death and burial. No one survived of his children. Only Fatima radiallahu anha, his one daughter. And even with Fatima radiallahu anha, he was the first one to tell her. As Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha radiallahu anha says, I was watching and he was whispering something to his daughter Fatima. So I saw her began, that she began weeping. And then later he whispered to her again, and she was happy and smiling. So I asked her, but she wouldn't reveal the secret of the Prophet ﷺ to me. She said to me, I will not reveal the secrets of the Messenger of Allah. But after the Prophet ﷺ passed away, now that he had gone, when she asked, when she persisted, Aisha radiallahu anha, and she asked her again, then she revealed. And she said, the first, now that he has gone, I will tell you. The first time he spoke to me was because he said to me that my time has come, I am about to leave. So I began weeping. Then later he whispered to me again and told me, but out of all of my family members, you shall be the first to meet me and join me. And indeed, Fatima radiallahu anha died six months after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Only six months later. So he lost all of his children, suffered bereavement after bereavement. And then for his one surviving beloved daughter, even with her, he was the one who in his own lifetime told her that after I die, you will be the first to join me not too long after. So if Allah wanted to make paradise for anyone on earth, Jannah for anyone on earth, he would have made it for the Prophet And as I was saying, so what exactly is Tumanina? What exactly is Itmi'nan? Does it mean peace or joy and happiness? How can a person find joy and happiness in bereavement? It doesn't mean joy or happiness as we think of it. It means being settled. It means being tranquil. It means not being disturbed. It means not being perturbed. And that's the meaning of Tumanina. It means being settled. No disturbance. No turbulence. And that's exactly what the Prophet ﷺ experienced in the highest form. Even in bereavement, his heart was mutma'in. Even in suffering, his heart was mutma'in. And that's what the verse means. That in, in the remembrance of Allah do hearts find tumanina. Not exactly peace, but settlement, contentment. Being content with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the reality of the world. So the, our purpose of existence is the akhirah. Our purpose of existence is the ibadah and the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Never forgetting him, always being mindful and observant of him. And realizing that the world and all that it contains is only an abode of test and that we will be tested repeatedly. We cannot make this world a Jannah. 
Wealth doesn't mean anything. Power doesn't mean anything. And we can see it now. If we think the Prophet ﷺ didn't have Jannah on earth, but others did have others have got Jannah, what Jannah do they have? What Jannah? People are people have billions. And yet they remain perturbed and disturbed, their hearts turbulent. Because it's human nature. If we are ungrateful, if someone comes back from Hajj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed them with wealth. They were able to go to Hajj. They enjoyed the journey. They were spiritually uplifted. They came back. They have so much to be grateful for. When they come back, 99 people come to visit them. And they shower gifts on them. They shower praises on them. They welcome them and they make them feel at home. But it's human nature. We ignore all of this. We ignore the 99 that came. And whilst the people are sitting in front of us, we are still disturbed that, why didn't Abdullah come? We have so much to be grateful for, but we're bothered about why Abdullah never came. One person. People have billions. They have all the wealth in the world. But they are not content or satisfied. And they remain disturbed, staying awake all night long, simply because they never got everything that they wanted. So that's not Jannah. Allah has not made the dunya Jannah for anyone, and He will not make it Jannah for anyone. Not even for Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He never made it for one. Because the Prophet ﷺ chose himself. Bal abdin rasula rather. I'd rather be a slave and a messenger. I was speaking about Ibrahim ibn Adham rahmatullahi alayhi. That he was, he used to, he was someone who used to say that um, he used to spend time in the wilderness all alone and he used to say, how can I be alone when I have Allah with me? And I'm not in the wilderness, you are. Ibrahim ibn Adham rahmatullahi alayhi was a famous scholar and saint who died in 162 Hijri. And he initially, he wasn't, he's well known. He's a, he's a highly regarded scholar and saint. In fact, he was the same age, if not younger, than the famous Imam of Hadith, Sufyan al Thawri. Famous Imam of Hadith, Sufyan al Thawri of Gufa in Iraq. Sufyan al Thawri was this great Imam of Hadith, revered. And yet Ibrahim ibn Adham rahmatullah was so pious that when Sufyan al Thawri sat in his company, even though they were the same age, and possibly Sufyan al Thawri may have been older, because he died a year before, Sufyan al Thawri was, would remain silent and he would not speak in the presence of Ibrahim ibn Adham. Simply out of respect and reverence. Ibrahim ibn Adham rahmatullahi was such a famous scholar and saint that once Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahmatullahi alayhi was ill. And even though he was ill, he was leaning against the wall. He was ill and leaning against the wall because he was feeling weak. So someone mentioned the name of Ibrahim ibn Adham rahmatullahi alayhi. So Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal sat up and said, it is not befitting us that the names of the pious are mentioned before us and we recline in this manner. And that was Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. And he was about the same Ibrahim ibn Adham. So who was this Ibrahim ibn Adham? Ibrahim ibn Adham actually came from the royal family. He, was, he, wasn't, he wasn't an Arab, he was from the Persian lands that had been conquered. 
and he came from royal blood, as a result of which his family were fabulously wealthy. Fabulously. They had land upon land. And Ibrahim ibn Adham grew up as a prince. One day he went out hunting. And whilst hunt when he went out hunting, he was just pastime and sport. He had such a huge entourage with him that they had animals, hunting dogs. His servants and those who were with him actually carried banners and standards and flags. That's how large his hunting party was. And whilst he was engrossed in hunting and chasing prey, all of a sudden he heard a voice call out to him saying, reciting the verse, أَفَحَسِبْتُمْ أَنَّمَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ عَبَثًا وَأَنَّكُمْ إِلِيْنَا لَا تُرْجَعُونَ That same verse which I recited at the very beginning. What do you think? That we have created you in vain? And that you shall not be returned to us? This one, the hearing of this one verse, on one occasion, shook him to his core. He dismounted from his horse, and he renounced that life. And from that moment onwards, he completely changed. Because he now realized the purpose. Of course, he knew, but he never really stuck. He never really, he never, he, he never really thought about it seriously. But it was only when he began, when he was shook, that he thought about it seriously and said, yes, indeed. I should make my life fit my purpose. And he changed completely. But anyway, that was Ibrahim ibn Adham rahmatullahi alayhi. It's just one example. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has advised us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us in the Qur'an what is the very purpose of our existence. We are not just highly evolved and highly intelligent animals who have just appeared out of nowhere by accident. Life isn't just a series of accidents. The strange thing is, people do turn to Allah. And people have different reasons for turning to Allah. And sometimes, it's often calamities and crises and accidents that cause a person to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we live our lives as though it's all by chance. It's just a series of accidents. And when we do suffer a real accident, we then turn to Allah. It's ironical. So... If we believe that we are just nothing but highly evolved animals, then unfortunately we will live our lives without purpose, without meaning, without direction. But if we accept Allah's words, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created you, why? Perhaps you may adopt taqwa. So that he may test you who of you is the best in deeds. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ مَا أُرِيدُ مِنْهُمْ مِنْ رِزْقٍ وَمَا أُرِيدُ أَنْ يُطْعِمُونَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الرَّزَّاقُ ذُو الْقُوَّةِ الْمَتِينَ I have not created man and jinn except that they serve me. I do not seek any sustenance or provision from them, nor do I seek that they feed me. Rather, it is Allah who is the, who is the great sustainer and the one of mighty strength. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who sustains. Allah has created us for his service. These are just some of the verses of the Qur'an that tell us about the very purpose of our existence. The taqwa and ibadah of Allah and to realize that this world and this abode is a test and that our real destiny is the akhirah and our return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is our true purpose. And I'll end but just by saying that, yes, there may be many questions, but this doesn't explain how we came to be here. Yes, Allah created us. The amazing thing is, look at where we are, who we are, and how we find ourselves. In this huge universe, whose expanse we can't even begin to imagine, In just our universe, in the hundreds of billions of galaxies, and 
in these hundreds of billions of galaxies in just our galaxy, in hundreds of billions of stars, we have one star around which we have the planetary system, our one solar system, which itself is spread across hundreds of millions of miles. And in, the, in the here, as part of this, there is one piece of rock known as Earth, and on that rock there are millions of species and living organisms. And out of all of those millions of species and living organisms, there is only one being which, to our knowledge, has the ability in the entire universe of higher intelligent thought. And of actually asking the question, why are we here? Who are we? Why do we exist? Now, there are two answers to that question of man standing on earth. Knowing no other intelligent life. Two answers. The one answer is, it's all a big game of numbers. It's one big accident. And a series of accidents and chance occurrences. And you're just an animal. And you're going to live and die. And nothing else. That's one answer. And the other answer is, you are unique. Because Allah created you. And Allah honoured you. This is why, amongst all of these millions of species, you are the only one with higher intelligence. Because Allah has elevated you and honoured you. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ And truly we have honoured the sons of Adam, the children of Adam. And it's not, that is the answer, that is a divine answer. The human answer is you're just an animal. This is life, this is death. We will live, we will die, and nothing thereafter. And the divine answer is you are unique, you are noble, you are honored because Allah has created you and honored you. And you have been created with a wisdom, with a purpose, with a direction. And you're, you are on a journey to the akhirah, to the hereafter. There is a purpose to all of this. That is the answer of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now it's up to us which of the two we take. Speaking of we live and we die, Allah quotes the Quraysh in the Quran. The Arabs, Allah quotes them in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they say, the Arabs, in here, illa hayatun al dunya namutu wa nahya wa ma nahnu mi'ubu'uthin, that it is nothing. But the worldly life, we die and we live. And we are not ones to be ever resurrected. And in another verse, the Arabs weren't stupid. Their view of life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quotes them in another verse by saying, وَقَالُوا مَا هِيَ إِلَّا حَيَاتُنَا الدُّنْيَا نَمُوتُ وَنَحْيَا وَمَا يُهْلِكُنَا إِلَّا الدَّهْرُ Allah says, and they have said that it is naught, it is nothing, except our worldly life. We die and we live. And nothing destroys us except time. That's why I said they were very intelligent. They weren't stupid. What does that mean? Nothing destroys us except time. It's that same belief that the world, the universe, dahr, dahr means time, meaning the universe. The universe is responsible for our life and death. We are just simply part of time and the aging process of the universe. We live and we die. We were nothing before we came here. We will be nothing after we die. We will never be resurrected. And we simply are born, we grow, we decline, we decay, we deteriorate, and finally we die as the natural process of aging, of time, of dar, and of the universe. So Allah quotes them, but Allah quotes them disapprovingly. And this is why the Prophet وسلم, came to them. Because, subhanAllah, virtually all of the laws of Islam, virtually all of them, were revealed 
after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did hijrah from Mecca to Medina, 13 years after the revelation of the Qur'an. So in Mecca for 13 years, if there were hardly any laws, there were a few, what did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam focus on? The Arabs weren't atheists. So they believed in and accepted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as being the Lord and the Creator. And Allah says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَلَئِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ لَيَقُولُنَّ اللَّهِ That if you ask them who created the heavens and the earth, they will surely say Allah. So the Arabs never denied Allah. They never denied the existence of Allah. They never even denied that Allah is the supreme Lord. They never even claimed that their idols and their stones and their graven images that they worshipped were responsible for creation, for sustenance, for provision. Never. They accepted Allah as being the creator, the greatest deity, the greatest Lord, the greatest God. Even they accepted Allahu Akbar. They accepted all of that. They were guilty of two things. One, they were guilty of associating partners with Allah. One. And the other thing that they were guilty of was denying life after death. That's something they never believed in. So for 13 years, the Prophet ﷺ, with the verses of the Qur'an, all of the most famous surahs of the Qur'an which come towards the end, which many of us know by heart, most of the Meccan surahs fall towards the end of the Qur'an, and the Madani surahs fall uh, at the, in the first part of the Qur'an. Most of the surahs of Mecca, if they contain no laws, what do they focus on then? This is it, they focus on two things. Tawheed, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and number two, life after death. Reminding people of life after death, of resurrection. That is your destiny and that's your purpose. So imagine for 13 years, this is what the Prophet ﷺ worked on. For 13 years, he worked on the belief of his own companions as well as the others, of accepting the Tawheed of Allah and life after death, resurrection. Because that is the goal and the purpose of our very existence. So even the Arabs would say the same, we live and we die, there's, no, there's nothing else after. Even though they accepted Allah, and this is the belief that Allah corrected. The Prophet wasallam corrected. That it's not just a question of living and dying, and no resurrection, no. You have to live your life as though there is another life. You have to live your life knowing that there will be resurrection. You have to live your life believing in accountability after death. And that's the way a Muslim lives. Belief in accountability, belief in the resurrection, belief in returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the purpose of our existence. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enables us to understand. May Allah make us amongst those who realize this and we should realize before it's too late. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, one of the other things that Allah will say to us on the day of judgment, one of the things is this verse, What do you think that we created you in vain and that you will not be returned to us? We will be told that on the day of judgment. And the other thing which we will be told is, مَا يَتَذَكَّرُ فِيهِ مَنْ تَذَكَّرُ وَجَاءَكُمُ النَّذِيرُ That did we not give you enough age? That in that age, with that age, anyone who should have taken heed would have taken heed. Meaning Allah has given us enough time, enough of an age to realize, to come to our senses, to take heed to recognize the purpose of our existence and the return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah, says, Allah will say, did we not give you enough age 
that anyone who should have taken heed would have taken heed in that age. And the warner came to you. According to some scholars, that warner can mean either the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or because it's to do with age that did we not give you enough age and the warner came to you the warner means she white hair white hair is a warner from Allah that your time is approaching for you to realize about your return to Allah and the young of us shouldn't think, oh, we've got a long time to go yet. We're not old. There are no white hairs. The great grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Imam Ali ibn al Hussein, ibn Ali. The great Imam Ali, the son of Hussein radiyallahu an, the son of Ali radiyallahu an. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, grandson Hussein's son, Imam Ali, whose title and label was Zainul Abideen, famous scholar and imam, revered, absolutely revered and loved by the people. In fact, the ruler of the time, when he arrived for Hajj in the Haram, he found that he couldn't make his way to the Kaaba because there was such a throng of people. Even though he was the ruler of the time and he had his guards with him, people never made way for him and he couldn't make his way to the Kaaba. So he accepted. And then before his eyes, all of a sudden, the entire crowd in the Mataf around the Kaaba parted and made a way. Not for him, but for someone else. And when he saw that person coming, he knew who he was, but feigning ignorance because of his hurt, even though he was a ruler at the time, he said, who is this that the people part ways for? And who was that? It was none other than Imam Zain al-Abideen, Ali ibn al-Hussein, radiyallahu anhum, the great grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, absolutely revered and loved. The entire congregation of the, of the haram parted ways and made a way for him directly to the Kaaba. Something which they did not do even for the ruler and the king of the time who was present on the same occasion. So that Imam Ali, Zayn al-Abideen, Ibn al-Husayn, radiyallahu anhum, he says, the age referred to in this verse of the Qur'an by which a person should take heed, that age, do you know what age he gave? He wasn't 40. I just saw some people whispering 40. No. He didn't just say white hairs. He didn't just say 60 or retirement, 65, 70, or 50, or 40, or even 30, even 20. He says the age being referred to in this verse of the Quran by which a person should take heed and should realize, and by which Allah has given him Enough of an age. You know what age he gave? 17. So the great grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Imam Zain al-Abideen, Ali ibn al-Husayn radiyallahu anhum says, by 17, Allah has given a person the last chance. By the age of 17, they should realize what is their purpose. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to understand. May Allah make us one of his ibad, his servants. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala abdihi wa rasooli nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Subhanakallahum wa bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilaha.